Howdy. This video is on converting matter to energy and nuclear weapons. Matter can actually be converted into energy and energy into matter. In a nucleus, some of the mass of the nucleons is actually converted into what's referred to as binding energy. And that's why the protons and neutrons stay together. That's where the strong force comes from. Nuclear power and nuclear weapons create an enormous amount of energy from a relatively small amount of mass. And so what you should be able to do with, after watching this video is understand that matter can be converted into energy and energy into matter. And why we can neglect the change in mass for chemical reactions. And so whenever you have a change in energy, you do have a change in mass. But only for nuclear reactions is the change in mass non-negligible. And again, it corresponds to the energy being so huge for nuclear reactions. You should understand that the higher the binding energy, the more stable the nucleus. And so remember, some of the mass of the nucleons is actually converted into binding energy. You should understand how a nuclear fusion reaction proceeds. Fusion fuse together. And so for a fusion reaction, we have particles to come together. You should understand why nuclear weapons are so dangerous and why there is so much concern about them. And so Einstein's theory of relativity had a few very interesting results. One is mass is not conserved. Energy is not conserved. Mass energy is conserved. And so all changes in energy do accompany a change in mass, but only for nuclear reactions is that corresponding change in mass non-negligible. For regular chemical reactions, the change in mass is negligible. You, you'll, you won't be able to measure a change in mass if you burn propane and collect all the products. The mass of the reactants of the products will be exactly the same within your measurement error. But for a nuclear reaction, because the amount of energy is so huge, you can actually measure a difference in mass. And so Einstein's term equation equals mc squared. It's actually equating energy to mass times the speed of light. And so E is energy, M is mass, and C is the speed of light. And so when nuclear reaction occurs, a me there's a measurable difference in the mass of the products and the reactants is observed. And we can actually use E equals mc squared to calculate energy changes of a nuclear reaction or binding energy of a nucleus from the mass defect or how much mass was converted in your energy if you're looking at, say, a nuclear bomb. Now, you can just make sure that the units work out. And so E equals mc squared, say your energy is in joules. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And put your mass in kilograms. Your speed of light is meters per second if we square that. Then we have kilograms meter squared per second squared, the exact same unit as a joule. And so units come out right if energy is joules and mass is in kilograms. In the first atomic bomb, the energy release was equivalent to about 30 kilotons of TNT, where a ton of, ton of TNT releases an energy of 4 times 10 to 9th joules. The amount of mass converted energy in this event is nearest 2. So it's really kind of an interesting question for the first atomic bombs, how much mass was actually converted into energy? And so if we use Einstein's equation and we solve for the mass, we get mass is equal to energy over speed of light squared. And so the amount of energy released was 1.2 times 10 to the 14th joules. Speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We square that and we get... 1.33 grams. And so it's kind of amazing to think about 30,000 tons of TNT, that's the equivalent, was produced by converting 1.33 grams of mass into energy. And so if you can convert matter into energy, a little bit of matter will give you a lot, a lot of energy. I mentioned we can use Einstein's equation to also calculate what's called the nuclear binding energy. And so the nuclear binding energy is the amount of energy released by the formation of the nucleus. And so if you have protons and neutrons separate and you bring them together, they're going from something less stable to something more stable, you will release energy. And the amount of energy released is the nuclear binding energy. You could also think about the nuclear binding energy is how much energy would you have to add to a nucleus to completely break it apart into protons and neutrons. Now, nuclear binding energy is 
produce by taking some of the mass of the protons and neutrons and converting it into energy. That's called the mass defect. And so the mass of a nucleus is always less than the masses of the protons and, and neutrons that are present. Kind of strange. Now for nuclear binding energy, the stronger the nuclear binding energy, the more stable the nucleus and the lower the potential energy. It's analogous to the chemical bond. The stronger the chemical bond, the more stable the molecule and the lower the potential energy. And so we can calculate the nuclear binding energy by using Einstein's equation. And so here we have the nuclear binding energy E equals M. Let's call this the mass defect. That's going to be the difference in mass between the product's mass of reactants and then we got the speed of light squared. And so the more, the bigger the mass defect, the more mass that was converted into energy, the larger the nuclear binding energy. And so the mass of a nucleus is always less than the masses of the neutrons and protons present. And so say we want to calculate the nuclear binding energy for carbon 12. And so what we can do is we want to get the mass defect. And so let's take the mass of the protons and neutrons. And so you have six protons, six neutrons. And I think the mass of the protons is 1.00867 grams per mole. Mass of the neutrons, 1.00728 grams per mole. Multiply both those by six. And then you subtract off the actual mass of nucleus. This can be found in the table. And so we get the mass defect as 9.899 times 10 to the minus five kilojoules per mole. Now the binding energy is going to be equal to the mass defect times speed of light squared. We found our mass defect, speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth. And we end up with 8.91 times 10 to the 12th joules per mole. And so the mass defect, the, the binding energy is rather large. An interesting question you could see there in the future is which of the following is the most stable arrangements of 10 protons and 10 neutrons? And so this is really kind of interesting. So each of these pairs of isotopes is composed of 10 protons and 10 neutrons. All right, you have 5 plus 5 is 10, 3 plus 7 is 10, 2 plus 8 is 10, 8 plus 2 is 10, 14 plus 16 is 20, 17 3 is 20, 6 plus 14, 20, 10 plus 10 is 20. So all four pairs of isotopes composed of um, 10 protons and 10 neutrons. And notice that their masses are all different. And so by combining them in these different ways, you're converting some of the mass into energy. And so the question is, which of the following arrangements of 10 protons, 10 neutrons is the most stable? And the answer is gonna be the one with the smallest mass because that means you have the largest mass defect. And so helium four plus oxygen 16. Now again, if you remember, I, we, when we talked about alpha particles, I mentioned that two protons and two neutrons, pretty stable. And we're saying that two protons, two neutrons, pretty stable. And so we can actually plot the binding energy per nucleon as a function of the mass number of the nucleus. Remember mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so it's kind of interesting, the binding energy per nucleon gives us a measure of the stability of the nucleus. And so what we're seeing is that iron is pretty much very stable relative to the other nucleides. Notice that uranium-238 is less stable than, than iron and deuterium less stable. Now, if we flip this upside down, we get something that looks like that. And so it's still the binding energy per nucleon, but we have zero on top and larger, more tightly bound on the bottom. And so now you can kind of think about it in terms of potential energy. And so fusion to fuse together where you take light isotopes, make heavier isotopes, you notice you're going from less stable to more stable, you should release energy. Fission, where you take a big isotope and you fiss fissure, break it apart, you go from less stable to more stable. And so there's nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. Based on this plot, you might guess that fusion can give you more energy because this slope is much more, um, much deeper, steeper, sorry. And so we've talked about these six, or I've mentioned these six reactions before, and the bottom two 
are not first order processes. Remember, radioactive decays are all first order processes. Those are first order processes. But fission and fusion are not first order processes. And so induced nuclear fission, a nucleus breaks apart into two roughly equal pieces plus neutrons. The first atomic bombs are based on just fission. Commercial nuclear power plants are all based on fission. Now on the bottom here gives us an example of a fission reaction. The products are actually going to range. So this is just an example. And so if you have a neutron hitting uranium-235, it can break apart into barium, krypton, and more neutrons. One interesting thing about the induced nuclear fission is that you actually produce more neutrons than you consume. And so this is how the re reaction propagates. The neutrons produced have to hit more uranium-235 and that would give you a chain reaction. If it's not likely that the neutrons produce hit more uranium-235, then the reaction will not continue. If it's highly likely, um, then the reaction will continue. And you can actually control the speed of the reaction by controlling the neutrons. And so in a nuclear re reactor, if you want to slow down the reaction, you put in control rods which absorb the neutrons. If you want to speed up the reaction, you pull out the neutrons, uh, sorry, pull out the control rods, and so you absorb fewer control um, neutrons. Fusion fused together. You have two, two smaller nuclei combined to form a larger one. And so after World War II, thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs were developed. And a hydrogen bomb actually has a conventional explosive that causes a fission reaction. And the fission reaction produces enough heat to actually cause the fusion reaction. And so hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear bombs, have conventional explosion, fission, and a fusion bomb. Now, you saw in that one plot, it was very steep for fusion. And so you can actually produce more energy for fusion reaction. Um, fusion is what powers stars. A while ago, well, what is it, 30 years ago, there was some scientists from Utah who claimed to have been able to perform cold fusion on a desktop. And if the reports had been true, it would have been truly revolutionary because fusion doesn't produce um, horrible nuclear waste. And if you could do fusion on a desktop, you could basically produce a limited amount of power, but people were not able to reproduce the results. And so fission, fissure, break apart, large atom to smaller atom, atom, you're going from something less stable to something more stable. Fusion, fuse together, you're going from two smaller isotopes to a bigger isotope. And again, because this is steeper, you can expect that potentially you can get more energy from fusion. Now for fission, it's all about those neutrons. So the neutron has to hit the uranium-235 and then the neutrons produced have to hit more uranium-235 for the reaction to continue. And so that's why we consider it a chain reaction. And so a sample containing Uranium-235 is subcritical if the neutrons produce from one fission reaction on average strike less than one uranium-235. And so often you'll hear, hear the term critical mass, and I, I don't think it's it's good. It's, it's a misnomer. It's more about density of uranium-235, and it also depends on the speed of the neutrons. But if you have a l large likelihood that the produced neutrons will hit more uranium-235, then you'd say it's critical, supercritical. If it's not likely that the, that the neutrons will hit more uranium-235, then it's subcritical and the reaction will not proceed. I mentioned that, you know, I showed you a, an example of a fission reaction. I mentioned that the products do vary. And so this shows you the fission yield, mass number. And so you see a wide range of products. And so this is one reason that it's difficult to handle nuclear waste from nuclear power plants. And so for induced nuclear fission, many di different isotopes are formed. More neutrons are produced and consumed, leading to a chain reaction. In nuclear reactors, excess neutrons are absorbed by cadmium rods or, or boron, I think they also use, the control rods. And again, putting in the control rods, you absorb the neutrons, you can slow down the reaction, pull out the rods, 
you absorb fewer neutrons, you speed up the reaction. Uh, nuclei produced have too many neutrons since are intensely radioactive. First in the test in the United States New Mexico desert, then 5,000 miles away at Hiroshima, and then again at Nagasaki, came the world shaking explosions of the atomic bomb. And so the first controlled fission was in Germany in 1938. The United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 during World War II. In 1951, U.S. built the world's first nuclear power plant. That's kind of interesting. Often in terms of nuclear bombs, you'll hear kiloton or megaton. And that corresponds to the mat, like the explosion equivalents in terms of tons of TNT. And so the first bombs dropped or fir first bomb in World War II were 20 to 30 kiloton and so that means they had explosive power of 30,000 tons of TNT. Now the question you could ask would be well how do you calibrate that right? Scientists are supposed to always calibrate know what those numbers mean. How would you calibrate? How would you know that explosion was equivalent to 30,000 tons of TNT? Well if you're the US government what you do is you take a lot of TNT, 100 tons of TNT, explode it and from that, you extrapolate what 30,000 tons of TNT would look like. May, 1945. The hot New Mexico desert seemed far from the ravages of war in Europe. One hundred tons of TNT a rehearsal to scale and calibrate the power of an untested atomic weapon. Two months from this day, man would unleash the destructive power of a demon locked within the very fabric of matter and plunge the world into the atomic age. For the next 20 years, testing the power of the atomic bomb would hold the world captive by events shrouded in secrecy. Events set into motion seven years earlier. And so to me, that kind of looked like a house of TNT. So 100 tons of TNT, basically a house of TNT. And so the Trinity test was a 20 kiloton nuclear bomb, meaning that it had an explosive equivalence of 20,000 tons of TNT. Remember, 100 tons correspond to the size of a house. Now we're looking at 20,000 tons. Now the size of this bo bomb actually to me looked like you know the size of a VW bug. blast instantly raised temperatures to 10 million degrees, releasing a force of a million pounds of pressure, vaporizing the tower and all desert life within a half a mile. The intensity of light was sufficient to cause temporary blindness to an observer 10 miles away. With a yield 200 times greater than the 100 ton test. And so that's the 100 ton the test. That's that black spot there. Nearly one half mile across. Compared to this that nuclear bomb. The desert sand into that's a green the black glass, spot. Still containing traces of radioactivity. And so the bomb was about the size of a VW bus. Sorry, bug, bug. Little, little compact car. And it was 200 times more powerful. And so nuclear reactions can involve a lot, a lot more energy. And so in World War II, the United States made two types of bombs. One bomb was like Little Boy. It was using uranium-235. And it was really pretty simple. And so you have a conventional explosives, two halves of uranium-235. You have what's referred to as initiator, 
the initiator will produce neutrons. And so your conventional explosives slam this piece of uranium into that piece of uranium, producing neutrons. You'll have what's called a critical mass, but again, it's more about the density. And so you'll have a very fast reaction. The neutrons produced in the reaction will find more uranium-235, and you'll end up with a pretty big explosion. Now, this design is so... They were so confident in this design, they actually did not test it before dropping this bomb on Japan. The other type of bomb developed during World War II was a um, fission bomb you're using plutonium-239. Now, for this one, you have a hollow sphere of plutonium-239. Inside, you have initiator produces neutrons, and then you have a sphere of conventional explosives. And so the sphere of conventional explosives are designed to compact the plutonium-239 until it's very, very dense. During the explosive, the initiator produces more neutrons, and so everything goes super critical. Neutrons find more plutonium-239. The reaction goes very fast. The uranium gun weapon, or little boy bomb, was a simple design, and scientists were confident it would work without testing. The fat man, or implosion bomb, was a more efficient design, using plutonium instead of uranium. Inside the very center of the bomb was an initiator, surrounded by a sphere of plutonium. This sphere was encased within a set of symmetrically located high explosive lenses, creating an implosion which forced the plutonium into itself, attaining critical mass. Critical mass. And so August 6, 1945, um, Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima. Again, that was about 20 kilotons, so it had an explosive power of 20,000 tons of TNT. Three days later, on August 9th, um, Fat Man, the plutonium bomb, was dropped on Nagasaki. And so Hiroshima before, Hiroshima after. The uranium gun weapon or little boy bomb, was detonated over Hiroshima at an altitude of 1,800 feet, the height to achieve maximum blast effect. Three days later, the Fat Man implosion bomb was detonated over Nagasaki. In Hiroshima, 70,000 people were killed or listed as missing. Of its 90,000 buildings, over 60,000 were demolished. The implosion bomb dropped on Nagasaki took the lives of 42,000 people and injured 40,000 more. It destroyed 39% of all the buildings in the city. With a yield of 20 kilotons, similar to that of Trinity, this weapon would be considered a nominal atomic bomb and provide a blueprint for all future nuclear weapons. And so if Japan had not surrendered after Fat Man, three days later, there would have been a third nuclear bomb dropped on Japan. So interesting question is, what is the total nuclear bombs that have been detonated, period? Well, you know, you had Trinity test at the beginning, during the war, and then you had the two that were actually dropped during the war. So that gives you three. But after the war, there was a lot of testing for design testing, how to make the bombs more powerful. There was even testing, how do you make buildings to be able to withstand nuclear explosions? And so if you thought less than 100, should be less than 500, it actually turns out that there are more than 2,000 nuclear bombs that have been detonated. Now the US has detonated more than 1,000, the former Soviet Union more than 700, Pakistan, India, China, Britain, France, all have tested nuclear weapons. And again, some nuclear weapons were tested for the design. Some were tested for to test how, how destructive they were. Some were even tested to see could, nu- could troops 
survive a, a nuclear bomb. On July 19th, the D-Day of Operation Crossroads, the atomic bomb supervised by Vice Admiral Blandy at Bikini Atoll in Mid-Pacific. Crews leave the target ships in Bikini Lagoon, many for the last time. The B-29, Dave's Dream, takes off from Kwajalein to deliver the bomb, equal to 50,000 tons of TNT, while an electric metronome counts the final seconds. Cover your eyes. Now, bomb away! Ships are tangled wrecks. The battleship Nevada is towed into position for the second test. Test Baker. King Judah of Bikini watches with Admiral Blandy as LST-60 moves into place. The bomb is suspended beneath LST-60 and is to be fired by remote control. The technicians and Vice Admiral Parsons leave LST-60 and the bomb. At the control room, Crossroads personnel are checked then locked in. Dr. Holloway, Los Alamos director, readies the firing circuit. 30 seconds before eight hour. Fifteen. Cameras are ready aboard ship and in the sky. Two, one, fire. that can destroy our world unless we find the road to peace. And so you can actually find these videos online. You can find a lot of pictures online. Again, over 2,000 tests of nuclear devices. And so the bombs dropped during World War II were all based on fission, fissure, break apart, uranium-235 or plutonium. After World War II, um, fusion bombs started to be developed. And again, the idea behind a fusion bomb is you have conventional explosives which cause a fission reaction and you need the heat from the fission reaction to actually cause the fusion reaction. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. Five, four, three, The 10 megaton yield vaporized the Pacific island of Ilujalab and left a crater deep enough to hold the Empire State Building. Ilujalab is completely gone. Nothing there but water and what appears to be a deep crater. Water dark blue in color. And so 10 megatons, that was the first um, fusion bomb developed by America. And so that's going to be 500 times more powerful than the drop bombs dropped on Japan during World War II, 500 times. Kind of hard to imagine. But the former Soviet Union actually dropped a 100 megaton bomb. And so that's 5,000 times more powerful than the bombs developed during World War II. 5,000 times. Safety couldn't be guaranteed. They could avoid being blinded by the light, but being knocked out of the sky was quite possible. The exact moment of release was controlled from the ground. The bomb had been given a parachute to slow its descent and give the crew more time to escape.
they did escape, but only just. The plume rose right through the cloud layer and kept on rising. It flattened out when the cloud was 40 miles high. The blast wave was still large enough to be measured on its third passage round the world. Because the bomb was detonated two miles above the ground, there was very little radioactive fallout. But the earth directly below the burst was seared by the intense heat. Rock had been turned to ash. The bomb was four times bigger than anything America has ever exploded. Why something so large? The United States could develop very accurate missiles. The Soviets never mastered that technique very well. And to compensate for that, they really could level a very large area and take out their intended target without having to actually hit the target itself. Aimed at a target the size of London, here's what would happen. The blast wave would obliterate everything in a circle 30 miles wide. The fireball would be 110 miles across, incinerating everything in its path. In so many ways, it's hard to imagine how horrific the bombs during World War II were. But now we have to imagine something 5,000 times more powerful. And so fission, fissure, break apart, produces a lot of energy, but nothing near compared to fusion. Now, the reason that you have to have a fission reaction in a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear bomb, is because it's hard to get fusion to occur. To get fusion to occur, you got to have two positively charged particles combine, get close enough. And so for that, you need high temperatures. That's why hydrogen bombs are also called thermonuclear bombs. I hope that was helpful.